All right then. Hello, Phil Common, Bienvenue, Kanichiwa, Ni Hao, Jambo. It's time for the Armist Inquisition yet again, episode 265 on Sunday, the 15th of January, 2023. I'm Phil. I'm Ben. I'm Matt. And uh, we're joined by a, a wonderful thought criminal tonight. <laughs> Allegedly, Dave. How are you, Dave? Nice to meet you. Uh-huh. I'm good. I'm good. I'm. I like that thought, thought criminal. Uh, yeah, there's plenty of us about at the minute. It doesn't take much these days, does it, to be a thought criminal? No, and uh, so I suspect that in uh, you know five years we'll be, we'll be running for our lives. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Best not to have a chip. That's the main reason not to yeah. be chipped. Very easy to track you down yeah. once you've had your implant, like they're doing in Sweden now. Mm. Those crazy mothers. Uh, I've just, Sam's just uh, come in the chat. Uh, Dave, just been listening to Dave on the Sheep Farm podcast. We were just talking about that before we uh, went live, weren't we, Dave? You've just met with those guys. Yeah, I was I was a bit surprised that uh, they got it up so fast. Um, you know, it was, only <laughs> couple, it was only yes, was it yesterday or the day before? I can't remember, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we're big fans right. of uh, the Sheep Farm boys. We met up back, back in uh, October, it was. I think it was. It was the end of October. Don and Chris, so yeah. But... Yeah, well, yeah, I'm hoping to meet them when I when I get back to England. Yeah, cool. Well, um, Dave, I um, I was saying before we started that there are so many areas that we could talk to you about. You seem to have done so much research in in very very sort of wildly disparate areas, and um, the main reason I I contacted you was I, I heard your chat with our mate Noble from CFR network uh where you were talking about the old testament and i thought i really want to talk to dave about this stuff because it just fascinates me ancient history and theology and the sacred texts and whatnot um so why don't you start by telling us a bit about how you got into this subject and and why you started researching ancient history okay um well um i actually woke up because of uh, 9 11. um i saw it i was actually there watching it and um and that that basically launched me in a into a, like a 18 year truth search for truth and um I, I, I guess you know what it's like when you when you start looking at a particular subject you find other bits of information that kind of uh, lead off somewhere else um and then you know eventually follow those and you're, you're you're down another rabbit hole um kind of like putting a jigsaw together um so yes you're right i jumped from one topic to the next to the next um and when i got to um the topic that shall not be named fe um (laughs) um that that kind of that 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 was the last straw to make me go and look at the uh, old testament something i'd been avoiding uh for most of my life i've been an atheist for 40 years so um been very successful in avoiding that topic but the, the fe um basically made me sort of uh, decide to read the book and see what it was really about uh-huh. um and uh, i was absolutely absolutely shocked to find that it was a story that i could understand um and it all made sense to me so that's where i started so did you what was your upbringing like did you have a an atheistic upbringing or a traditional Christian upbringing, or um, well, my my mum was a, uh, a Roman Catholic, but she's non-practicing, oh, yeah. and um, she decided that uh, uh, rather than force a religion she, she had no use for on her, her children, she uh, she said, "Well, I'll let you find out for yourself and figure it out. You know, figure out what you want to believe yourself." Um, so I had no exposure to it never went to church never went to sunday school never went to any of it um uh i was fascinated when i was from the age of about six by the greek and roman gods um i read this book that we had this it was wonderful um and i was shot i I was a bit gutted when i went to school went to history thinking it was going to be about these these gods but it was about the battling of hastings instead (laughs) and i was like and then i went to uh re rk it was called religious knowledge um thinking ah okay now i'm going to find out a bit about all these roman gods um and no it was about uh, jc and i was like oh 
So um, I, I, I sort of thought, no, nope, they're all control systems. Don't want anything to do with it. Yeah, so that was it. That, that must be quite a unique perspective to sort of come at this fairly fresh and in later life as an adult because generally um, the culture that you brought in, brought up in has some sort of effect on you, you know, through your childhood, whether you're raised in a Christian school or or even in a, from an atheistic perspective, that would give you a certain leaning when you start doing the research. Absolutely. I mean, you know, most people are what they are because that's what their parents are. You know? Yeah, exactly, if, yeah. If, if you were born in uh, Iran or something, you'd be a Muslim now. You know, if you were, if you were born in India, you'd be a Hindu. You know, it's just it's that one of those things. But, yeah, you're right. I, I didn't have that, so um, I, I chose atheism. Um, and that seemed to serve me well for, for a good 40 years. But once I woke up, uh, and I, I really believe the most high kind of, um, you know, was, was pushing me, nudging me in certain directions, because uh, basically what it what it did, this, uh, this awakening, was show me parts of the system, parts of my world that I believed were absolutely real, and then deconstructed them for me. Um, so... Um, and I was just, I literally, I was just writing this to somebody as, um, uh, you know, before you came up, um, essentially it left me no choice. Um, so I, I, something got deconstructed in front of me and the only choice I had was, do you, um, do you change your life or do you continue to live the lie that you just found out? And the only choice I've got is, well, I've got to change my life. Now that's, that's quite, that would be quite a painful position psychologically i think a lot of people would find themselves in i think a lot of people would just decide to go along it might be uh more comfortable to just sort of go along with the status quo well yes it, it is um and and i i think i, I don't want to sound like a conceit or anything but i got to that almost that pinnacle so i was in america um I was making a whole lot of money. I was a, a computer programmer on Wall Street, making a whole load of money. I had a Ferrari on the driveway, my dream car. I had a big house, I had a, a room full of man toys. <laughs> and um, and one day, um, and I literally just told this story a couple of days ago. Uh, one day I was in the Ferrari and I stopped at traffic lights and people crossed the road in front of me and I stood by the side of me um, looking at the car. And I was sitting there and I looked at, looked at them. <laughs> I looked straight ahead, looked back at them, looked back at ahead. I thought, I'm in a car from, from where I'm sitting. This could be a, a, either a Ferrari or a Ford Fiesta. I don't know, because I'm in, inside the car. So did I buy this car for me or for them? And, you know, after... You know, long night. It was the answer was I bought it for them, and then I looked at the big house that we were in, and and you know it was a big house, and there was four of us rattling around in the thing, and I remembered that you know what when we were um, together in a in a small bungalow, um, we were all together and we were you know having fun, but now we're in this big house all separate separate, um, you know we were kind of uh, split apart almost. So, you know, that the idea of this big house just unraveled and so on and so on. Every every aspect of my life unraveled. And when I saw the truth behind it, um, you know, I couldn't just ignore it and live the lie. I had to change my life. Yeah. Can I pick up on something you said before? You, you said um, the most high. And this is something I've heard you say in other videos on your channel, other presentations you've given. And it comes across to me as a very deliberate terminology to use is that correct mm -hmm. and could you maybe Absolutely. explain what why you use that term rather than god or something else well um here's the thing all those titles that we have for them for the most high um were created for us they were um if you look in the old testament you find that um the word the, the name of the most high was actually taken out and replaced by all these other words which Turns out they all mean fallen angels, essentially. So um, G-O-D stands for uh, Gad or Gadriel, who was the angel in the garden. 
according to the Book of Enoch. Um, El or Elohim is, you know, the word El means fallen angel, essentially. Um, you know, Lord is Baal and so on and so on. Yeah, Lord of the Flies, but be Beelzebub. Baal-Zebub, yeah. And I noticed you had on your um, waiting screen, you had Baal on the other, you know, the depiction of Baal on the side. Do you know that? Yeah, he made it. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the Baal worshipper over there, okay. <laughs> Would you like to explain yourself, Ben? Why you <laughs> picked that image? <laughs> oh, you know, it looked, looked pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it looked. Yeah, didn't do it for okay. me. I did it for the onlookers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, you mentioned the the Garden of Eden there. Can you explain that? That Gabriel, the was it Gabriel? Galadri Galadriel. Galadriel. Gad Gad. No, not Galadriel. Is always right. <laughs> no, no, Frodo. Um, <laughs> it's it's Gat. It's Gadriel, or you know, so G A D R E E L. Um, so Gadriel or Gadriel. Um, so um, essentially, we've been given us a, a, a Christianized story. Okay. Um, so essentially, what? Okay, I'm going to have to step back a sec. Um, so uh, from piecing things together from uh, books like the Quran and uh, other sources. Um, the story I got was that before before Adam, uh, before the period of the Old Testament, um, the earth was populated, there were civilizations and stuff, and um, it seems like one of the angels was the governor of the earth. And um, those civilizations were destroyed because of the Most High's fierce anger, and he started off with a clean slate. That's what they call the gap theory in um, the Christians call it. So between verse one of Genesis and verse two, there's a there's a gap of an indeterminate number of years. So um, when the Most High started again with, with Adam, he told Ad, uh, he told the angels to worship Adam as if they, as if you know he was the Most High. And one of the angels, the chief of the angels, said, no, I'm not worshipping this mud man. You know, I'm, I, I was here first. I'm more powerful than him. You know, I'm not doing it. And um, he basically um, started a rebellion, as it were. Now, the first attack in that rebellion was um, an angel coming down and, um, and seducing Eve. And you find that in the Book of Enoch. Um, now, the reason why I'm pretty sure that this is the, what's happened is because of the word. Um, <laughs> I might have to step back a bit again, but I'm, I'm maybe not. But um, the, wor the words in Paleo Hebrew are, are very, very, very specific. Okay. Um, I do a demonstration of how specific, but I'll leave that aside for now. But um, a word is a word picture. So one word um, encapsulates a whole experience, okay? So I think where the uh, confusion came is that a word was, was um, inserted or swapped in the, in the translation of, um, of the Old Testament, of Genesis. So um, when it was talking about the garden, it talks about a snake, now the word is for snake is and um, I might get this the wrong way around, but nagash with a G. All right, so the g sound is in the middle of the throat. But there's another word, nagash, okay, which is uh, the g sound at the back of the throat. Okay, they're very similar, and they sound very similar as well. But one means snake. And the one, when you take the other one, when you take all the, the meanings, it essentially means um, um, an angel. Um, and it tells the story of, and let me, let me sort of uh, list the, the meanings of the word. The meanings of the word are uh, to lie with, uh, to lie with a woman, to have sex, to uh, adduce an argument, um, to adduce an argument, uh, to, and I, I can't remember, but it basically tells a story of an angel who, who, um, oh yeah, to, to, to sleep with an enemy, uh, to sleep with somebody as an enemy, okay? So it tells a story of 
an angel who had sex with Eve, but not out of love or anything, but as an enemy to, to do something. And that was essentially to, to mess up the bloodline. Um, so that's what happened. She had sex with the, with the angel. And then she showed Adam what to do. And Adam and Eve were meant to be immortal. They were going to be the immortal governors of Earth. And you can find that in the Wisdom of Solomon. I think it's uh, that's one of the books of the Apocrypha. Um, that he, the Adam was created as an immortal. So they were supposed to be immortal, but as soon as they had sex, right, they lost that ability to be immortal. Is part of that the symbol, is, is that the apple? Is that apple's story being symbolically thrust in there? Yeah. The taking of the apple is more, from yeah. Eve is more of a, a euphemism, if you like, for taking well, the flower. We'd recognise it if it was, uh, you know, the cherry, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking, yeah. That's very yeah, interesting. So, mm. so um, um, and, and... Sorry, go on, Dave. Yeah, I was just going to say that that um, incursion was repeated later with the actual fallen angels in Genesis 6. So it's a pattern. It's a, it's a plan to destroy a bloodline. That would be the Nephilim, chapter 6, Genesis. Mm -hmm. So was there any offspring from the uh, Eve fallen angel relationship? Indeed, that was the uh, line of Cain. So um, because Eve had sex with uh, the angel and then Adam, she gave birth to, to two children, one of each, one of each father. So um, <clears throat> Cain um, exhibited the some of the uh, traits of these these uh, nephilim that he was wicked he was deceitful um I'll, I'll, again i'll step back a second humans naturally can't lie they can be taught to lie but they they don't lie because um think about it you know when you when you lie and i've again i feel like i'm repeating these things i've just did, said the same thing to the sheep farm i think um when, when you lie, your, uh, your whole body goes, I'm lying, I'm lying. Yeah. <laughs> um, not only that, but all these um, processes happen internally. So you, you start sweating, you start shaking, you know, your blood pr pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up, all, the, all that sort of thing. Basically showing you that it's uncomfortable to do that. Okay. Um, yes, you can be taught to get over that. Um, but but naturally, no, humans can't lie. The Nephilim, when they, you know, they don't they don't suffer from those problems. Yeah, they they've got no empathy. Um, they're essentially psychopaths. And uh, so when they lie, they don't show any outward um, appearance. So they can lie through their teeth and we'll believe them because we don't see we don't feel that they're lying. Does that make any sense? Yeah. When you were talking about the characteristics of of the Cain lineage, uh, would one of those characteristics be things like art, art, artificers? Is that the word? Uh, people who make things. I'm thinking of Tubal Cain and further down the, the bloodline. Yep. Right? People who are interested in building and architecture and machines and smelting and things like that. Well, Cain built the first city, according to the book. Um, and the fallen angels, well, the first thing they did, you know, after, after the, yeah, you know, spawning their own bloodline is they started teaching. Um, the, it was the children of Cain first. They started teaching technology. So that's why Tubal Cain was the first artificer, because, uh, he, you know, they, that line was taught um, by the fallen angels. They're, I believe they're still responsible for our technology today. And so what about the other bloodline? So the, the bloodline, bloodline of Adam. Yeah. Um, so, um, so what happened was um, when, when Genesis 6 occurred, when the, the fallen angels came and, uh, and had sex with women, spawned the other uh, bloodline, well, the Nephilim basically mixed with humanity so much you know, to, to essentially wipe out the bloodline um, that, 
you know, it came down to one man who's left. One man who's left with Adam's original blueprint. And that was Noah. Um, and the Most High waited until the very, very last minute. <laughs> So it came down to two people with the with the bloodline with the bloodline of Adam, and when Methuselah died a week later it was the flood. So he literally, most I literally waited for the very last minute, um, and then um, Noah was uh, married to it turns out a woman of the line of Cain, a um, woman called Nama, who was the daughter of Lamech. Lamech married two, two daughters of uh, a guy called Kenan, who was of the line of Adam. So Zilla and um, I can't remember the other, the other one, but he married these two women and um, they gave birth to a, a, a daughter uh, and um, this Nama married Noah. So the line of Cain's bloodline was, was represented in you know, the survivors of the flood. Um, so the children of Noah were corrupted. And a week before the flood, when Methuselah died, um, Noah had to find wives for his three sons. So the only women who were available were corrupted. So the Nephilim DNA found its way on the other side of the flood through the DNA of the children. That's what I was going to ask you. So this is how you account for post-flood Nephilim in the text, that they were integrated yes. into Noah's family. Indeed, but there's for for the uh, the giants, um, the post flood giants. Um, well, there was a little story just straight after the flood of um, Ham going in and seeing his father naked, um, and uh, and and that. Do you remember that story? Vaguely. Yeah, Ham Ham goes in and apparently sees his father naked, and then Noah curses Ham's son Canaan. OK, now um, the, the phrase to uncover a father's nakedness means to sleep with his wife. <laughs> OK, and you find that you find that in Leviticus. OK, so it says it says the same phrase in Leviticus and says it's uh, sleeping with a wife. Um, so Ham basically had incest with his mother. Right. Which is why Canaan. Is that the offspring of that union was uh, was cursed, not Ham? Okay, because now um, think about it. Um, Nama was uh, of the line of Cain, so she had Nephilim DNA in, in her. Um, you know, the Ham himself had Nephilim DNA um, from that, and then they got together, and it's essentially concentrated that Nephilim DNA in their son. Canaan, right? And that accounts for why all the giants were Canaanites. All the giants came from Canaan because there was a concentration of that DNA in Canaan. Right. And then, so I presume other giants, because there's, there's talks of, uh, is it Gog Magog? Is he one? That's why, uh, that's way later. I mean, we're, um, if you're talking about the Gog Magog I'm talking about, um, that's that's like 1103 BC. That was uh, way way later. Oh, practically, practically last week. That <laughs> yeah, yeah, way later. <laughs> yeah. What's what's your sort of timeline for for like the flood then? What what sort of in in normal years? Ooh. How would you describe it? I I I, I, I can't remember actually. It's three. And I, I I did have the number, but it's uh, three thousand. Oh no! Yes, it's about um, three thousand five hundred BC, right? Or three, yeah, something like that. Yeah. So before, because I mean, standard model of history would put ancient Egypt and Sumeria to about two and a half thousand BC, I guess, starting somewhere around then. So a good that a good millennia before that. Mm. So yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I can't remember offhand, but that's that's just popped back into my head. So I'm, yeah, I might not be right about that. And so, where does sort of Egypt and and like the the other c civilizations we know about? How do they play into the the story from Genesis? Because each culture has its own sort of creation story, its own myth, doesn't it? So how how does it integrate? Uh, because um, at one point everybody spoke one language. 
uh, and this language was Paleo Hebrew. And um, so there was one story essentially of, you know, these, these gods, you know, the fallen angels um, that lived at, walked among people on the earth. Okay, so when the Tower of Babel fell and everybody scattered with their own languages, they took the same stories, but the names of the gods changed because they've now got different languages. And, uh, you know, Chinese whispers, the stories got, you know, tweaked a little, but it's just, they're, they're all the same stories. And um, funnily enough, those stories are still being told today, um, but most people don't recognise it because it's in Hollywood because most of the Hollywood films are essentially retelling the Fallen Angels stories. I was going to say, it sounds like an excellent Neil Gaiman mod uh, novel so far. It'd be, <laughs> who's listening to the podcast? I'm, I'm, t I'm telling you, it's it, it's an amazing science fiction story, the, the Old Testament. Uh, and and the, the amazing, the more amazing thing is, it hasn't finished yet. It's still going. And we're in it. We, I can point to where we are in the book. Where? Yeah, where are we? <laughs> point, point. Where are we? Um, as, uh, as, as not, um, I guess, as not... Uh, well, do I need to buy a boat, Dave? <laughs> yeah, do we need to start no. collecting animals? <laughs> no, but uh, if, if, you, if you live, I believe, if you live in America, right, you, you might want to get some... Um, <laughs> you might want to get some, some uh, I don't know, fireproof clothes... <laughs> Oh, wow. wow. We're talking yeah, um, brimstone. Oh, wow. Burn. Yes. I mean, I, I think literal because uh, um, I, I, I did a video called um, Prophecy and Judgment where I, sh I showed looking at um, the signs in the sky, um, what, was, what I think is going to happen in the next uh, two or three years. Does this come to sort of the ages with the equinoxes, like the age of Aquarius, the age of Pisces, Taurus, is, is that what you mean by looking up at the stars or is it something more specific, conjunctions? Oh, no. Or? Um, no, no, no. For some, here's the thing. Um, the Old Testament is very literal, right? It's not going to talk about things that you have to learn about. It's going to be things that you're going to see and go, bloody hell, you know? <laughs> um, and one of those things, you know, is, is now considered entertainment. But you know, a thousand years ago, if you saw if you saw an eclipse a thousand years ago, when all of a sudden the sun goes black, black, right? You would run for the hills because you knew something was going to happen, right? So um, that is one of the signs in the sky that the Most High talks about, right? And um, it just so happens that uh, a lot of eclipses um, happen at certain times when when um, things. Uh, occur for the Israelites so um so yeah um I, I don't want to give you too much information because it takes a lot of uh, exp explanation to get there right well you you bring up the Israelites maybe this would be a good time to sort of uh, segue into that and what your inter interpretation is of who the Israelites are where they come from okay well um going back to the beginning um so after the flood Right? You've got uh, you've got all these people who are corrupted with of Nephilim DNA. Right? Post flood, the Most High is going through the bloodlines and he's choosing certain people. He's saying, out of my out of Noah's three sons, Shem is the chosen one. He's the one with the most of you know the most Adamic blood, as it were. Okay. Um, and then because of the way DNA works, you know, uh, traits sort of disappear and then pop up again later on and whatever, um, he chooses a particular line of people. So out of Shem's five sons, our Faxad is chosen and then skips a few generations and it's e Eba. And then a few generations later, it's, um, it's Abraham, okay, and so on. Right, so Abraham was was told he had to marry his half-sister, Sarah, okay? Um, now, Sarah was barren, and so Sarah gave um, him, you know, her handmaid, an Egyptian woman, and, um, you know, they had a child, Ishmael. But that was that was Abraham's firstborn. But the Most High said, no, he's not, he's not chosen because he's not of the same bloodline, right? You have to, your child is going to be from Sarah, 
and indeed she had a child at about 100, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, so when Isaac had children, Isaac was born of Sarah and Abraham, when Isaac had children, something new happened. So he had twins, and um, those twins, um, the, the firstborn, all the Nephilim DNA was concentrated in the firstborn, Esau, okay? And in Jacob, it was absent. So um, now Jacob's blood had been purified of the Nephilim DNA. So all of his offspring were now chosen, okay? Um, Esau, again, concentrated um, uh, Nephilim DNA. That's the, that's the, the battle that's the war that's been going on ever since that time and is still going today. Between so the sons of yes, Isaac. All, yes. Right. Um, and you might recognize a name for the sons of Isaac, right? Saxons. Okay. Saxon means Isaac's sons. Right. <laughs> okay. Right. So you've got two types of Saxon, right? You've got Saxons, Isaac's sons, and you've got the Anglo-Saxons, the angelic sons of Isaac. And when it says angelic, it doesn't mean the good angels either. Okay? <laughs> right. So, yeah. um, so as I said, there's this war going on. There are lots of other nations, but, you know, according to, as far as the Bible's concerned, it's not interested in all those other nations. It's interested in the most highs people, the ones who have got the most... Um, of Adamic blood, right, and the other fellas, uh, the children of the fallen angels, and that is the battle that's raged ever since. Um, I think I was going to say something else, but I've forgotten it. What about? Um, I'm just thinking about the Islamic world. Don't they trace their heritage to Ishmael? Yes, they do. Which is a yes, generation earlier, isn't it? Uh, yes, yes, it is. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, well, so what do you mean by that? So, then? so aren't they sort of, have they sort of been cut out of the, the, uh, Isaac son war, if you like? Uh, yes, yes. Because again, um, the aim was to get back to the Adam, the original blueprint. Okay. So, um, Ishmael wasn't of that blueprint. It wasn't, it wasn't pure enough. Um, but Jacob was, and uh, and Esau was the opposite. Okay, so so it makes sense because you you end up with equal and opposite. You've got the most highs um, offspring, so twelve or thirteen tribes of Israel, and right now today you have um, twelve or thirteen bloodlines of the Illuminati, who are the other fellas. So that's the war that's been going on. Um, and uh, if you go back to that story of um, Esau and Jacob, well, Isaac had the um, inheritance of the whole earth, okay? And not because as, as like a ruler, but as a steward, which was Adam's original job, really. Yeah. Um, so um, when it came to the time that, uh, you know, Isaac was going to die and he wanted to pass on the blessing, normally the firstborn will get it, right? just because they're for the firstborn. But the Most High already said, no, it's Jacob who's going to get the, the blessing. So a bit of, uh, you know, messing around, and Jacob ended up with a blessing. I um, Esau came back and, uh, and was like, you know, realised he didn't get the blessing. So he begged his father for a blessing. Uh, and his father said, um, you're going to live in the best places on earth. You're going to live luxuriously but you were going to do so by the sword, by warfare and, and violence, okay? Um, but Esau's blessing was a temporary one. So Esau's blessing came in um, uh, at a time we called the Renaissance period, okay? So 500 years ago, their, they, their blessing came in. They started rampaging across the earth, killing, maiming, destroying, and now they live in the best places on earth, and, you know, they got there by the sword, right? Um, but it was only a temporary blessing. It's only temporary because Jacob got the real blessing. So 
Esau's blessing is running out. It's, it's, it's ending right now, right? 500 years down the line, it's gone, which is why that bloodline is rushing to essentially exterminate the Israelites because they believe if they can exterminate the Israelites, then they will inherit the earth by default. Now then, when you say Israelites, a lot of people listening probably have a different conception of who you're talking about. That be, Would that be fair? Yes, because uh, one of the bloodlines of the Illuminati right, um, has essentially um, usurped that identity. Um, in fact, the people who've, who are usurping the identity used to be called the name stealers. Like the Khazarians and the Khazarian Empire, they would um, they would literally okay because they, where they were situated, uh, they were in between essentially the west and the east. So um, people traveling, merchants traveling from from the west into towards China, say they would have to pass through Khazarian land. And so what the Khazarians would do is you know, welcome them in, say, hey, how do you, come in, stay at my house, you know, have the best seat in the house, have the best food, you know, let's feed you up, let's get you drunk. And they would question them, you know, well, where are you going? What's your, what's your full name? You know, well, who's the person you're going to meet? You know, how much are you going to pay for it? And once they've got all, enough information, they'd kill the person and then go and make the trade, <laughs> all right? So they'd usurp that guy's name and... Um, you know, and, and, and work that way. So um, the people you're thinking of, well, they've told you they're not the real people, right? Because they don't call themselves Israelites. They call themselves Israelis. They don't call themselves Judeans or, or Yahudim. They call themselves Jews, yeah? They don't call themselves uh, Shemites. They call themselves Semites. It's all word magic. OK, um, but even their own scholars say they're not the people. They're not the real people. Um, so the real people, the book says, were going to be in the last days, they were going to be coming out of a period of 400 years of slavery and affliction. And uh, if you look in Deuteron yeah, <laughs> if you look in Deuteronomy 28, the second half of where it talks about the curses, it, it tells you what that slavery and affliction is going to look like. And it was going to be the worst ever. You know, every time the Israelites were in a blood covenant with the Most High, you know, they agreed to be the Most High's people. And the Most High said, well, if you follow my commandments, you are going to be blessed. Right? And uh, it lays out the blessings in the first half of Deuteronomy 28. But he said, if you don't follow my commandments, it's not going to go well for you. And um, the second half of Deuteronomy 28 tells you what they were going to have to go through. Um, so the Israelites kept messing up all the time. They kept following other gods and doing all these nasty things. And they kept getting, getting punished. Now, the, the, last, the last punishment, the final punishment was going to be the worst. 400 years of hard slavery and hard affliction okay ending in the last days and um when it ended you'll get the people are going to start to wake up and remember who they are in fact the the name of the old testament wasn't always the old testament it, its actual name is the book of remembrance right because it was written by the israelites back then for their ancestors or their descendants, sorry, their descendants who are alive today, so they can remember who they are and who their most high is. Um, so, yeah, sorry. so when does this sort of hijacking take place? Is it when the books are written down? Are we talking sort of, uh, you know, five, 600 BC when I think that's sort of the mainstream opinion when this sort of, sort of book started to be collated and written down? Is it before that? Uh, when you say hijacking, what do you mean exactly? When the name stealers, as you put it, mm -hmm. started to steal the names and steal the history, if you like. Right. Well, the the current okay, the current name stealing of these people, well, it started in uh, the ninth century, um, 
when they basically, the Khazarians basically um, converted to a religion that they made up. It was basically a pagan religion, Babylonian religion. Um, and uh, they called it Judaism. Never existed before. You know, the, the Israelites didn't have a religion. They just had a way of life. Okay. Um, but they made this religion up, converted to it. And uh, now they pretended that they're, you know, they're the, uh, the actual Israelites. Um, but 500 years ago, as I said, is when this bloodline, um, you know, became to basically to became dominant in Europe and uh, and began their rampage. Um, have you got any top tips on spotting a Nephilim? Okay. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the thing, okay. Um, it might upset a few people, right? Um, but humans, according to the book, humans look like me, okay? Maybe a bit darker than me. Um, now, um, the children of the fallen angels look very different. They looked absolutely alien, okay? They were like pale-skinned. <laughs> well, no, no, not, not actually like you because, well, somewhat, because unfortunately most of us are, are corrupted by this, this Nephilim DNA. You know, I've got green eyes and, um, and I've got excess body hair. There are a couple of the traits of the Nephilim, right? But, um, but the Nephilim looked like they were pale skinned, blonde hair, blue eyed. Okay. There's no melanin in their, in their body whatsoever, or the, the right type of melanin. Okay. Um, so uh, the reason I know this is because when Noah was born, Noah was, um, was um, born slightly different. So as a, as a sign that he was going to do something, you know, amazing in his days. Okay. And when he was born, his father, Lamech, was terrified. He said, I have, I've given birth to a, a son that uh, doesn't look like me. He's, he's, he looks like the children of the fallen angels. And the description of Noah was that he was born um, either blonde or white hair, mm. very pale skin and uh, blue eyes. Right? And, um, and apparently it changed as he got older. Um, but so we know what the children in the Nephilim look like. So they, would, they looked alien, but um, their method of warfare right, where, is when they find a population, they infiltrate that population and, to, and get into positions of power. And when they've got enough power, they would you know, um, overrun and kill all the males and rape the women and then take on the identity of the people. Um, and then rewrite history so you don't know about the original people. And that's still going on in the world today. I mean, um, a couple of hundred years ago, an Australian was a, was a very black man. Now an Australian is a, uh, is a you know, white European. You know, so it's just the same process is going on. Now, that's not to say that all white people are Nephilim. <laughs> that's not true, okay? Um, what's happened, as I said, is this invasive species who were a very, uh, very small number of them at, at the beginning, this invasive, this invasive species has, has infiltrated humanity and then changed um, not only the look of humanity, but changed the societal norms of humanity so that, you know, their DNA and traits don't look out of place. Right. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Um I was reading uh, years ago now um, Graham Hancock's book on uh, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the sign and the seal, and uh, he was talking in that book about this this sort of community of Ethiopian Jews, and what was really striking about them is that he described like their customs as being like a very old version of Judaism, almost as if they'd been separated. <gasps> And I wondered if this uh, is something you come across, or whether that played into your research. This idea. Yeah, while he was while you were talking, I was trying to uh, remember the uh, name of the place that you're talking about, um, and it's gone straight out of my head. It's where Axum, Axum. That's capital, um, isn't it? That's yeah. That's apparently where the um, where the Ark of the Covenant is. 
at the moment. And um, now it says in the Old Testament that, um, uh, no, I can't remember where it is now. Ah, I'm not one of those people who can just reel off the chapter and verse and all that. But, um, but yes, uh, uh, I believe a, a thousand men of each, of each uh, tribe went um, to Ethiopia with uh, the Queen of Sheba. So there was a contingent of Israelites who went with, a, you know, to to Cush or Ethiopia, um, with the Queen of Sheba, and um, it's supposed that they took the Ark of the Covenant with them. So that's why it's it's in it's being guarded to this day, in a in a place called Axum, by people whose whose whole lives are about guarding that that site. Yeah, and aren't they blind as well? The priests or the monks? I think they're blind, the ones who look after the ark, supposedly. supposedly. It, it could be. It could be because um, apparently it's a it's a powerful, powerful weapon. It was used in the Old Testament. It was used as a weapon, um, just like in uh, you know Raiders of the Lost yeah. Ark. You know, when the <laughs> Nazis open up. Don't look up. at it. Don't the look at face it. Face melter. <laughs> <laughs> well, who did we? Yes. We had someone on a, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, talking about maybe some sort of radioactive material oh, being yeah. in the ark. Maybe that was the cause. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, something to do with orgones, wasn't it? Yeah, he was, was the orgone guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? I mean, when we're not meant to know everything, yeah? Oh. We don't, you know, there are, there are things in the world we, we've got no idea about. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we I, I think it's arrogant of us to say that, oh, we know what's in it. It's radiation and this. No, I don't. We don't know. We don't. Well, it's supposed to be the tablets, isn't it? The tablets that Moses yeah. brought down. And didn't they burn his face as well at some point? He, he had to wear a hood, a veil or something? I, well, I don't know about that. But um, I do know that the priesthood were the only ones who were allowed to be anywhere near it. And they were the only ones who were allowed to you know, go into the temple and uh, anyone else would die if they went in. Um, wow. So, yeah. And it's, and what's funny is, um, so not far from where that is, where the Ark is, um, is a, a place called Malawi. Have you heard of Malawi? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you know what that word, you know what that place name means? No. no. Right. So think about it. There's no V in Paleo Hebrew. Yeah. No V. Uh, the where you see a V, you'd use a, a a kind of W sound. It's a wow sound, right? So, Lewi is Levi. Malawi means city of Levi. Wow, and that was sort of the the priestly class, the Levites, wasn't it? Um, yes, that's the priest class. Um, so. Uh, I believe when when um, the Israelites were in Egypt and they started the the, uh, the, the enslavement, the, the Levites were separated. So the Levites didn't go into slavery. They were separated. And apparently they ended up in what we call Malawi now. Right, because I think at the time the Egyptian empire was bigger than what we currently recognize as the country of Egypt. I'm sure it went down further south into I think what they called Nubia or, or the Kush, I think maybe <clears throat> that would make right, sense. Well, well um, okay. There's a story about Jacob in the old Testament about when he went to get his wife. Right? Um, he worked for seven years for um, a guy called Laban and um, Laban tricked him uh, and gave, uh, you know, he was after Rachel, but he, he tricked him and gave him Leah instead. And so he ended up working another seven years for, for Rachel. The reason why, one of the reasons why he did that was that while Jacob was with him, Laban was getting very prosperous. Right? He was, he became, you know, he was his sheep and oxen just, just multiplied and, and he was very prosperous. So it seems that when the Israelites are in a place, that place becomes prosperous. So when Egypt had the Israelites there. Egypt became uh, became the world power. Okay. Yeah. Similarly, when America took the Israelites into you know into slavery, America became the world power. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I was going to ask. Um, 
I don't know anything about this guy. I just remember hearing about him years ago on the news. Uh, Haile Gabri Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia. And I wondered if there's some sort of correlation here between your sort of theology and, and that theology. Well, um, as far as I know, um, Haile Selassie uh, traces his uh, lineage back to, um, you know, a son of Solomon, King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. That's right. So he he um you know expresses his royalty from that from that line you know so solomon was was of the royal line there is only one royalty in this world it's of the line of uh, of king david um now in england we had that royalty that royal line um and it ended with the stuart line um with charles the second funnily enough yeah <laughs> I don't think it's I don't think it's an accident we've got Charles III now, but but yeah, Charles II was the last of that that uh, um, you know that uh, royal bloodline. Um, what happened next was um, when they, when Charles II was deposed, a white Germanic bloodline took the throne. They usurped the throne, and that Germanic bloodline is still on the throne today. Is that is that William of Orange? William of Orange. Um, and then um, somebody else, I think, I can't remember, it was Ed, Edward, no, I can't remember. Uh, Frederick married um, a daughter of, of Charles II, or um, I can't remember, but it, they married into that bloodline, but they weren't, obviously, because the lineage follows the father, they weren't actually, you know, of the bloodline. So their, their offspring weren't um, of the bloodline because the lineage follows the father. Wow. So as I said, we've got a uh, we've got this. Um, I think Frederick was of the Hanover Hanover family. Um, so we've got a Germanic bloodline on the throne, and not the actual um, original Davidic one. Um, and you know, you, we live in the United Kingdom because of James. You know, King James. Uh, he was again. He was of that bloodline. He was of the line of Fares, and. Um, and he actually was the one who united, you know, Ireland, Scotland, and France, and even France actually, uh, into the United Kingdom. Okay, it's that's why we have the Union Jack. It's a reunification of Jacob. Yeah, um, it's it's all. This is all connected. This was supposed to be, or England was supposed to be, the New Jerusalem, right? the new stronghold of the uh, the Israelites. But it wasn't sanctioned by the Most High, so it collapsed very quickly. Um, so yeah, sorry. That's I've got a, a video called "Why Great Britain Is No Longer Great or British," um, and I, I go into that. Does um, I'm, I'm just uh, we're coming up to time soon, but you, you mentioned the uh, the New Jerusalem there. I was just wondering, does the the Crusades play in this at all? Because that was I don't know if that's the same sort of royal lineage. It's it's obviously it's about six hundred years earlier, but you've got these sort of French nobles primarily wanting to take Jerusalem. Mm. I to be honest, I have I concentrate my research because it's it's a massive topic. <laughs> Just a bit. Um, yeah. But I concentrate my research on on um, because I was looking for my own lineage. I was looking for, you know, where do I fit in, you know? And so I was concentrating on what happened in this country. And um, so I, I didn't go into the, the Crusades. Um, but, I, uh, you know, along the way, I found out what, how this country was, was founded. Um, and it's not what you think either. Well, go on. You can't can't tease us like that, Dave. How was it? How was it founded? <laughs> I just had to bring that in. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, what's the traditional was... story first? Ah, uh, well, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I know what the traditional story is. It's a. It's a bit murky, isn't it? It's hazy. It's like, is it? Is it King Arthur? Or is that? Was that real? Is that a legend? Or yeah. Um, well, it turns out that um, this country was founded by a. Uh, and the Hebrew Israelite, who was a Trojan prince. Oh. Okay, so after the fall of Troy, this uh, this this guy, this prince, who's called Brito, or anglicised to Brutus. Brutus, yeah. He uh, he arrived in 1103 BC in, in Totnes, and um, he found that this country was overrun by red-headed giants. <laughs> right? um, 
Yeah. Wow. Red-headed giants, 18 or so foot tall, with uh, covered with shaggy red hair. Um, the king of the giants was called Albion, which is why the country used to be called Albion. Um, so the Israelite, the, uh, the Trojans basically wiped out all these giants, apart from one. Um, they left one alive because one of um, Brutus's men, Corinius, wanted to fight a giant hand to hand. So they had this epic battle on, um, on Plymouth Hoe, right? So they were fighting and, uh, and this, this giant whose name was Gog Magog, right? So you mentioned it earlier, yeah? yeah? This giant Gog Magog right, got, got Corinius in a bear hug and crushed and broke some of his ribs. And Corinius got so angry, he ended up throwing this giant over the cliffs. And the place where he, you know the, the giant landed was uh, was renamed Lamb Go Mago or Giant's Leap. And on Plymouth Hoe, up until the 1700s, there was one of those chalk drawings on the hill oh, wow. of two giants fighting. But it was actually a giant and Gog Magog and uh, and Corinius. And today, in Lord Mayor's Parade, they parade two giants, Gog and Magog. But it's supposed to be Gog, Magog, and Corinius. No way. I love the whole because um, there's so many civilizations who trace their their lineage back to the Trojan War and refugees from from Troy. It's it's very romantic. Mm. It's I find it very attractive. Uh, so well, did yeah, you know what good. the uh, did you know what the first um, name of London was? No. Off the top of my Troy and over. Oh, that's better. <laughs> yeah, let's let's take it back. <laughs> New Troy. Well, Troy New no, Troy. New Troy, yes. Yeah. And there's a um a tribe of people who used to live around that area called the Trinovantes. Tro New Troy. New Troyites. <laughs> so this is like before the Romans when you've got the Brigantes and the Iceni and the Trivantes. Brigantes. Yes. Wow. Because it's Again, he, he arrived in 1103 BC. Yeah. Way before the Romans. Absolutely. And I believe, um, you know, Hadrian's Wall, um, I, I believe that that wall has been there for a lot longer, way, way before the Romans, because it was there to keep the, the red-headed giants out. <laughs> Russ Abbott. <laughs> well, yeah. well, it's true, because um, that's what the Great Wall of China was, to keep the giants out. And there are walls all over the earth, keeping these giants at bay. You know. Yeah, the uh, the one I'm interested in as well is the one that goes across Wales. Oh, it's dear. sometimes called Offa's Dyke, but there are there are theories that that could have been the Severan Wall, and that the Romans actually built a, a, a wall from Chester to Bristol. And it's been again, it's been lost in in translation. And when people in in the Roman history books say the set set tips. Severan Wall, they mean one that's north of uh, Hadrian's Wall, but it's not. It's this one that cut off Wales. That's near the river. I would Severn, suggest I would suggest that was a wall like Hadrian's Wall, again, to keep the red-headed giants out of Wales, because the Welsh were were always called little little black people. Yeah. Tall, you know, I've got a I've got a book from the 1900s called uh, um Riddle's a pre prehistoric man, and um, it talks about the little dark Welshman, um, you know, and, the, and describing, well, it literally de it describes, um, I don't know, I'm, get, I'm getting, sorry, I'm getting two books mixed up. Um, it was The uh, Origins of the Anglo-Saxon Race by Thomas Shaw, and it talks about how, um, I don't know, Hartford and Buckinghamshire had people who, li who looked as dark as the Welsh. Um, and you know it was yeah. So um, Scotland, Ireland, and uh, and Wales were black countries. Uh, Britain, which we call England now, um, was mixed tribes of black, brown, and and white people. Fascinating. Well, Dave, we've just ticked over an hour now, and uh, uh, I could. Talk I haven't even to started. <laughs> I know I could talk to you all night, but you know. We've got to let you get on with your life. I mean, all the links are in the show notes yeah. for people to follow Dave and, and visit his website. Do the uh, the Muggle test. Hey, I did the Muggle test, Dave. I oh, got, yeah? yeah I How'd got, you do? Uh, level five. 
Level five. Oh, God, that's, that's a bit poor, actually. Oh, no! <laughs> oh, don't say that. I think there was, no, a, there, there was a bug in it. There was a bug, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> is there anything you want to leave us with before you go? Before we let you go? Is it one of your Ferraris? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, um, the, the thing I like leaving people with about all this, right, um, everything that's going on in the world right now, right, it's not important. Right? All this stuff right, isn't important because, um, can I tell you the, the, the big secret? Go on, man. Can we put it Shall behind the paywall? Big <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, spill. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the big secret. Okay. The big secret is you're going to die. <laughs> what? what? Never. I thought yeah, I was going to live forever. Straight, no, but it might sound funny, but this is the this is a secret. They're trying to get people not to to realize that you know that they're going to die, right? And get people afraid of this idea of death. Right. The point is, it's the only thing that is is inevitable about your life. It's going to end at some point and you don't know when, where, how, whatever. It's it's going to happen. So you can take that off the table. Right. Everything that's going on here out in the, in the world that seems scary and whatever doesn't matter because you're going to die at some point anyway doesn't matter if you die because there's a pin somebody sticks a needle in your arm and uh, and you, you keel over or you trip over a paving stone and hit your head and and, and that's it right doesn't matter right so don't live your life in fear right? it, none of this matters what matters is how you play this game right how do you how do you uh, react to all this stuff that's going on there's only two choices you can either react righteously or wickedly. And you're going to get scored at the end on how you do. Well, hopefully we'll get further than level five. <laughs> <laughs> That's, so uh, play well. Play yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, it's not about winning or losing. It's how you play the game. It's mm. what my dad used to tell me exactly. when I was three years old. <laughs> yes, yeah. very good. He was, to, he was trying to tell you something. Yeah. I mean, I'll have to check him, his blood for Nephilim. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave, this has been wonderful. Thanks a lot for joining us. Um, like I said, links are in the show notes. Why are you not subscribed to Allegedly Dave's YouTube channel? No, I know. You really should be. <sighs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure, Dave. Um, stay on right. the line for us for a minute while we play ourselves out. And uh, the rest of you watching in uh, YouTube land, mm. we'll be back in 10 minutes or so for part two, do some news. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See Take you soon. care. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Ciao, bella. Bye. Thanks, Dave.